Hi, my name's uh, Dominic Williams. I'm from the Definity Internet Computer Project. <coughs> uh, I think the, uh, I got muddled up with a talk title, so we're actually going to look at a thing called Threshold Relay and Probabilistic Slot Consensus, which is a specific uh, set of protocols within the Internet Computer Project. Um, nonetheless, a very important piece of it. Of course, uh, an Internet Computer, and when I say Internet Computer, I mean something like Ethereum, uh, but with much better performance and unbounded capacity, i.e. a kind of cloud 3.0 that can uh, scale out its capacity, its, its processing capacity and its storage capacity to uh, any size needed. Uh, now, an internet computer system will, of course, comprise many different components, in fact. And, you know, your consensus uh, protocol is just one small piece. So, you know, obviously, an internet computer project involves a lot of work with virtual machines and language design and things like that. Anyway, nonetheless, uh, an internet computer needs to uh, find a way to bring millions of individual nodes in the network uh, rapidly to consensus. So, uh, back in October, Definity demonstrated a test network. Um, on the public internet with about 500 nodes globally distributed, and uh, it was reaching finality in about a second. So that's kind of 60 times faster than Algorand or Hashgraph, and sort of 600 times faster than Ethereum today with its ghost-based proof of work. Uh, so let's um, <clears throat> take a look at how that works. Um, the first piece of the equation is called threshold relay. And this produces an incorruptible, totally incorruptible, unmanipulable, and unpredictable decentralized random beacon. And we can start off with some intuitions about what this uh, incorruptible, unmanipulable, unpredictable random beacon can be used for. Well, first of all, you can use such a stream of random numbers to drive other protocols. Uh, specifically decentralized consensus protocols that run much faster. And if you think about it, Bitcoin, uh, that first protocol that came out in 2008, uh, is, is itself driven by random numbers. You know, people do, a, uh, everyone's, you know, trying to solve these proof of work puzzles. You get something that's beneath the target, it's a random number. <clears throat> it's a form of, uh, and, and, and you know, the, you, you can now try and broadcast the block and become a leader. Um, you can also uh, power all kinds of other protocols using uh, this very special kind of random beacon. So you can use it um, at the net in the network itself for, for purposes such as validation. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of protocols uh, such as validation towers and validation trees, but you need uh, a random beacon like this to power them. You can also actually drive high-level uh, decentralized computing algorithms using a random beacon. So there's a project called Phi, for example, that, that's meant to ape the workings of the commercial banking system, and it tries to originate loans using, uh, by, by putting validators in a game using random numbers. So just a quick back, background there. Um, I need to explain unique deterministic threshold signatures. Okay, so threshold relay depends upon these things. There's, there's a, uh, a signature scheme called BLS that we use that came out of Stanford. That's uh, Bonadins, Drachen signatures. Ben Lin, who's the L, works at Definity. Okay, so usually, as everyone I'm sure is familiar with, uh, a signer creates a signature on message data. They have a public key and a private key, and uh, using their private key um, and the, the, the message, uh, they can create a signature. And, uh, you know, anybody can take the message, take the signature, and take the public key and, and verify that the signature has been correctly produced. This is just bog standard cryptography. Now, it gets interesting when <clears throat> you use a unique and deterministic scheme. So something like ECDSA, uh, when you create the signature, you inject some random, uh, randomness. Um, so you could actually create lots of valid signatures on a message. But with a unique and deterministic scheme, there's only one correct signature. Uh, given the public key uh, and message. Now, if you think about it, uh, well, obviously the signature is 32 bytes, so it's a large number, and it, it's a random number, right? That signature is a random number because if the signature wasn't random, 
um, you'd be able to predict what it was. And this can't be the case by the uh, security claims, right? If you could predict what the signature was, um, and it wasn't random, it wouldn't be secure. And so, you know, modern cryptography wouldn't work. Uh, anyway, so then we realized that potentially this is a very powerful random number generator. Now, it turns out that unique and deterministic threshold signature schemes are also possible. This means that you have a group of signers who share a public key, and they will create signature shares. And when you combine the signature shares, you, you, you get a signature, right? And just as before, the verifiers can take the message, they can take this threshold signature, right, or, which is, you know, created by combining these signature shares, and take the group's public key, and they can validate that it's correct. And it's also a deterministically produced random number, right? Where it gets really fun is that with a threshold signature, you know, you only require some subset of the group to create signature shares. You only require signature shares from some subset of the group to create the output threshold signature. But the magic is that it doesn't matter from which subset of the group you collect signature shares. The signature that's produced, the threshold signature that's produced, is always exactly the same. Bit for bit, exactly the same. And you can probably see that this gives you all kinds of, uh, provides all kinds of potential for uh, the design of fault tolerant uh, protocols. But really, it's kind of like a, like a magic, right? That you've got this message, and you give this message to a group, and this group creates signature shares on the message. But it, and, it, and it doesn't matter what subset of the group sign, right? Let's say half the group has to sign. It doesn't matter which half of the group signs. The output uh, threshold signature will always be exactly the same. There's only a single output signature possible given the input message, the public key of the group, right? It's completely deterministic. And really, of course, this signature, signature is a deterministic random number. So uh, important observations of this sort of magic. Uh, you know, a group is identified by its threshold public key, and it can only produce a single valid output signature on given seed data. And you, you see that I'm using the word seed, it's like a random seed, right? Um, the group is fault tolerant. Um, and any subset of threshold size can distribute signature shares for combination into the signature. Um, the resulting threshold signature, of course, can be validated by anybody who has the group's public key and the seed data, the message. The signature is a deterministically produced random number. And given a group's public key and the input seed data, the verifiers reach immediate consensus on the random number produced without running a consensus protocol. Incredible, right? Think about it. You, have a, you could have a network of a million, a million nodes, right? And they're connected using a broadcast, a P2P broadcast protocol. And you push out the, uh, you push out the, as long as everyone knows the public key of the group, you can push out the, 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 the message, the seed. The group signs the message. And everybody in that network, of, you know, those million nodes all around the world, can agree uh, on this random number that's produced, right? Without running a consensus protocol. And uh, of course, the intuition here is that if, if you can uh, enable everybody in this huge network to agree on a number without running a consensus protocol, this is extremely powerful because you can use a sequence of random numbers to drive a consensus on arbitrary data without using a consensus protocol. So we're going to create a decentralized uh, verifiable random function by relaying between such groups to create a random sequence. So just quickly, what's the, what's the network, network model? We have a vast peer-to-peer -peer, uh, broadcast network of mining clients. Um, these are registered on, on, on the ledger, right? So typically, in, in the case of Definity, you'll deposit 1,000 defini Definities um, in order to create a mining identity. And, um, Without going into the details, you, you, you know, the network proceeds in epochs. And when you register a new uh, client or a new group, 
you know, that new group or client doesn't become active um, until the current epoch, epoch plus two. And so long as you ensure that no fork can exist longer than an epoch, you can guarantee that everybody has, has always got a consistent view of the, of the participants in the network, right? Anyway, uh, so these um, nodes, right, these mining clients, which are created by identical stake deposits in our model, um, are randomly assigned to groups. And they're assigned to groups by the random beacon. These groups uh, try to set up a BLS threshold scheme by running a DKG, which is a di distributed key generation protocol. And they actually use, in our case, the blockchain as a sort of bulletin board to do that. And we're also making, but when I get into details, playing around with zero knowledge proofs and things like that to speed it up. Um, so once they, or if they successfully manage to set up their threshold scheme, they register their group public keys. Here you go. This is what's happening. And this process obviously proceeds asynchronously in parallel with whatever chain mechanism you have, so it doesn't slow anything down. Um, as regards the blockchain itself, um, at each height in a threshold relay system, there is a current group, right? And you know, the current group here is indicated by the sort of purpley pinky dots. And now this current group signs the previous group's signature. Now remember, the deterministically produced threshold signature is uh, a deterministically produced verifiable random number. So uh, you know, if you create a new random number using a previously produced, unmanipulable, deterministically produced random number, you get the same properties. Um, and this new random number then selects the next group, right? You, have a, you can imagine there's a bunch of current active groups, and you, you, you know you, you, the current group at H signs the previous group's signature, creates a new random number, and this random number selects the next group, which will sign the previous group's uh, signature. And you say so you sort of relay, and um, the relaying between the groups is unmanipulable and infinite. So this is what it looks like. You know, here's the yellow group has produced a signature on the previous. Uh, group signature. The pink group um, is selected by that random number and it um, broadcasts a signature on the previous, uh, using the previous signature as a message, right? And so <clears throat> this goes on ad infinitum. So you get this kind of sequence of uh, random numbers that are unmanipulable um, and the, uh, are completely unpredictable, of course, because you need the next group to collaborate to produce the next number. So, you know, the, the technical word is uh, verifiable random function. It's just a sequence of signatures on the previous, using, which uses the previous signature as a message, uh, in every case produced by a threshold group. Um, so the random number sequence is deterministic, verifiable, and manipulable, and also unpredictable. And so we've got consensus on a sequence of numbers without a consensus protocol in a huge network, potentially, right? And, of course, we've done that without a consensus protocol, which is very powerful. So we can use that to drive uh, uh, other protocols. So Donald Luth said random numbers should not be generated with a method chosen at random. And uh, I think that's something worth remembering when you look at some of the protocols around today. Anyway, fault tolerance example, just quickly so you can see how robust it can be made. Uh, if you have 10,000 processes in your network, 3,000 are faulty, right? 30% are faulty, 70% are correct, obviously. Um, and if you, let's say the group size is 400, and uh, therefore, you know, uh, the threshold is 201, in order for the group to fail to produce a random number, uh, 200 or more of the group would have to be faulty, right? So if you randomly select 400, right, um, what is the probability that 200 or more are faulty? Well, it's just hyper hypergeometric probability. It turns out, you know, 10 to the minus 17 i.e. heat death of the universe. It's just not going to happen. And of course, I forget, if you just increase the group size to like 500, it goes to 10 to the minus 23 or something. It just, just goes up and up and up, right? So um, it's very easy to get any, any level of fault tolerance you want. Um, now, what is the communications overhead? I mean, it's kind of funny in this day when everyone's trying to use uh, PBFT and things like that, you know, um, these expensive traditional uh, consensus protocols. What is the cost of creating a random number? Well, 
you know, the signature share will be distributed. Each node will distribute it, broadcast its signature share. Um, you know, it'll have, to, it'll have to list its process ID, uh, the signature on the, you know, on, on the previous signature, signature share on that, and, and then, a, you know, an, an outer signature, about 84 bytes. It works out that in a practical network with 400 nodes in the group, um, you, distrib- you broadcast about 22 kilobytes to create the next random number. 22 kilobytes is nothing. Literally nothing, right? So you almost get it for free. Um, so, okay, so let's do something with threshold relay. Um, we, there's a thing we use called probabilistic slot consensus, which is a relatively simple protocol. It's described in the paper. I'll just try and give you the basic ideas. Um, at each height, what we do is we order all the processes, i.e. the mine, you know, the nodes. I call it a process, but, you know, it's like a mining client, which has got this mining identity, which are created by making a deposit. Um, you order all of the, uh, let's say, million processes in the system, obviously very straightforward, and uh, that's the first thing we do. So at each height, you've ordered the processes, right? And we assign slots to them. So, you know, if you're at the top of the uh, ordering, you're a slot zero, slot then slot one, slot two, slot three, and so on. And we then uh, kind of create a, a leader um, priority list. So, you know, if you're in slot zero and you publish a block, right, you score that block as one having one point. If you're in um, slot one, it's half a point. Slot two, it's a quarter of a point and so on, right? And you can do some additional things with timing and so on we won't go into. Now, trivially, by doing that, you can create and score blockchains that converge, right? So here I'm just... Uh, illustrating how we choose between two competing chains, the orange chain and the green chain. They're both rooted together at H minus 3. But you can see these uh, um, two different chain heads had different scores, right? Because the blocks, that they're comprised from blocks in different slots. And the best parent is, is this one. It's um, uh, scored as three and a quarter points versus three points, right? Now, of course... The usual, usual limitations apply. So, I mean, this is, uh, you know, probably something you've probably heard of, selfish mining attacks and uh, nothing at stake. So, selfish mining attacks uh, exist, have existed for a long time, you know. I mean, um, I mean well-documented in proof-of-work systems um, like Bitcoin. Uh, nothing at stake is something more pertinent to proof-of-stake networks where somebody, you know, deposits some kind of security bond to create an identity that allows them to participate in the network. Um, The problem with both of these problems is that they slow down finality. They make the chain less consistent because you have to allow the um, chain to run for a very long time in order to be sure that, uh, you know, there's not some hidden fork that can be sort of brought out of a hat suddenly, you know. So the solution, of course, is to get the threshold groups to notarize blocks. And you can only reference a valid block. When you create a new block, you can only you know, base it on a previously created valid block. And a, that means a block that's been notarized, right? that, that itself has a threshold signature. And um, this means that it's no longer possible to you know, hide um, some fork and sort of bring it out later in order to gain some advantage. Um, you know, you have to publish a block at the time to get it notarized by the threshold group at that height, because once that group no- relays to the next group, it's too late to get the block notarized, and it's just a dead block. That, f- that fork, if it exists, is uh, permanently killed. So we get super high consistency and rapid finality. Um, without getting into the details, we have... Um, means of finalizing the chain in normal optimal operation in just two uh, blocks. So uh, back in 2017, there was a Definity test demo and of a sort of internet computer. We had a, it's kind of fun, we had a 500 nodes around the world um, on the public internet, obviously, and uh, we had a sort of uh, Haskell-based smart contract language and so on. And anyways, um, it was producing, we were running a half a second block time of producing finality in one second, right? 
which uh, is the kind of performance we want. I, I just believe a lot of the protocols out, out there at the moment are just totally impractical, and people only really think they're practical because there's this kind of assumption in this kind of frothy market we have that a blockchain is somehow a use, useful construct in of itself, and I don't really believe that. I think you have to build useful systems that apply uh, distributed computing protocols within them to achieve some, deliver some utility. And for the most part, if you want to create an internet computer, you know, you really want to be, I mean, you want to achieve finality in just a few seconds. Because nobody wants to like press a button and then have to wait around for a minute to see if the computation actually happened, right? No one's going to use that in the mass market. It's junk, it doesn't work. So you need to have very fast finality if you want to create something that people will actually apply in practice. And this is what uh, this does. And ultimately, if you just want to understand broadly uh, how it works, you know, we've, we're applying threshold cryptography to enable the network to agree on a sequence of random numbers without running a consensus protocol. And then we're using that sequence of random numbers to drive agreement on arbitrary data. And uh, this is a very powerful approach. And it's not like you know, a traditional BFT uh, protocol where you might have a leader, for example, with a hard timeout. And you know, if someone DOSs the network and the timeouts are exceeded, you just get a sequence of nil blocks. This thing, even if you DOS this uh, network, you know, the, it'll, it'll slow down. You know, for consistency will go down. The, but it'll continue to make progress, which is a very important property. So, yeah, there you go. I missed the results. Public internet, 500 clients, global distribution, one second finality. Uh, miscellaneous, I think I've run out of time now. So, that's it. Anyway, that's our threshold relay, and PSC works. Thank you. Good.